welcome back to Four Corners of the Galley. I'm your host, P. Bo, and you're joining me on another edition of Unsolved, the Murders of Biggie and Tupac. We're all the way up to episode five, The Art of War. And let's kick this sucker right off. Man, let's get this going. From the start, this is the best episode so far in the series. I'm so excited. After a minor speed bump in episode three, episode four, Game momentum and episode five has completely wow, what a complete finally a complete full episode in all three storylines. All right, so we're gonna kick it off like we did last week, folks. We're gonna go through the three timelines, but we're gonna go Biggie and Pac first, 2006, and then 1998. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. All right, so let's start it off. So the show starts off where we all wanted to start off, where it's basically Pac in the hospital waking up and his eyes blinking, trying to figure out where he's at. He's a, He has no comprehension what happened. And he's looking around. He sees doctors. They tell him he got shot. They tell him all the different places. And he's like, Doc, does my shit still work? He's like, yeah, you're still good, man. Your stuff works. He's like, oh, all right. So he was happy about that. That clicks out. The next thing you see is he's having flashbacks of the what happened, and his eyes open up again. And there's his mom, Afina Shakur. So his mom's there now, and she's trying to calm him down. He starts freaking out, telling her, we got to go. These dudes came at me. They might come at me again. She's like, look, no one's going to go through me. Don't worry. You're good. Let's do this. He's like, all right, well, I need to go to court. She's like, no, court. He's like, no, I'm not getting in trouble for nothing. I need to go to court in the morning. That's that. They have that. They have this moment. Next thing it cuts to, it cuts to basically the famous scene, which is actual footage you can see where it's Pac being rolled out and he's all messed up and he's got the beanie on and he's all beat up and he's trying to direct traffic around so people don't get hurt and he gets convicted of four and a half years for, to this day, which we will never know if it was real or true or set up. I mean, it just seems so weird and funky, this whole case that happened with Ayanna Jackson and he gets sent away. And at that point, we get to see basically Pac going to jail and how he is his first day in jail being set up and how he just became just like everybody else, just another number in a line, has to do everything that everybody else does. He might be the hottest rapper in the game with all these movies and different things like that, but it makes no difference. The law says he messed up and now he's stuck like everyone else in prison. So you see this thing walking through, he's walking through Gen Pop, he's getting a little hate, he's getting a little love, he's feeling okay, and then he finds him where he's going to be locked away in solitary confinement. He's like, man, what the heck? He's like, look, it's not, I don't make the rules, you just got to go in there. It has this great imagery when it shuts a door and then you just see Pac's face through the through the mirror of the, I mean, the glass through the of the door, and I just feel like I had this like flashback to his first ever single, which was Trapped, which was a song about him being trapped and how he was in prison. He got me trapped, and it just felt like I clicked right back to that moment. I thought that was really powerful, and just see him, and then boom, pops, pops put away. I mean, man, great, great opening. Definitely showed a lot of good stuff. Um, the Fini Shakur and Tupac uh, talking back and forth. Where she's basically trying to ask him, you know, what does she remember? And he's telling him, look, and, the, and he's in his eyes, the last people he saw was Biggie, Puff, and C's, and he thinks they're a part of it. And he's like, there's no way they didn't know nothing about it. How can they not know they up there? I'm getting robbed, and the next thing I know, I'm up there, and I see them. So she's she's telling him that, and he, that's all he thinks. So, whew. So the next time we see Pop is he's in his cell and he's going crazy and his, and his, and his mind's going crazy and he starts yelling out of nowhere and you're like, whoa, what the heck is happening? And it shows this real, this like demonstrative lock caged away man and how he's breaking because he's been locked away in this prison. So it kind of like cuts back and forth, but before it cuts to where him and a feet, where it kind of cuts in the middle of when him and his mom are talking when she visits him, it cuts to Biggie. And I want to get to the Biggie part where Biggie is basically starting to go on tour and he's talking with C's. And him and Caesar are having a conversation about the whole Quad Studios event and how, you know, he can't believe this happened. And Caesar's telling him he's hearing things in the street that he's blaming him. He's like, nah, man, that's my boy. Pac knows I didn't try to do nothing to him. He knows. And then at the same time that he's saying that, Afini comes to visit Pac in prison and they're having this conversation. And she can see it in his face. She's like, you're detoxing off the weed, honey. So what do you mean? And she starts breaking down the different steps of the detox and things. And he can see it in his mind that he's processing. At the same time she does that, she quotes the art of war. And he's like, and he kind of gives this look. She's like, what, you're not up on it? And this is the moment I love. Because it just shows how smart these people, how smart Tupac was and how smart Afini was. These people 
where they love literature. They read books for days on the different things, all different types of literature to understand the world better and to get a better perspective. She schools them on the art of war, and this is a big moment for the whole show, the episode, and just him in the crescendo, because basically what it's establishing is that he takes this book, Art of War, and reads it while he's in prison and uses the t techniques and strategies to get out to systematically go at bad boy when he gets out that really unites this East Coast, West Coast war they started. And he does it so strategically and so proficiently that the media and everybody actually think this is real. When this man it was so deep in it, it was all about the art of war and how he was going to break it down and take them out systematically. I mean, man, what a good freaking back and forth reference. I mean, that was just... Gorgeous to see that thing. I mean, just gorgeous to see that was set up. I love that setup. The way it was played all together. The whole overall arching story, the art of war. This whole episode is kind of almost built like the chapters where you have 2006, 1998, and Pac and Biggie kind of like matching the the chapters of Art of War and what they're doing, you know, setting up and getting information, learning their opponents, strategizing, and then eventually attacking, which we haven't got there yet, but this is more about the strategy and the gathering of information episode. So Pac gets that. <clears throat> Cuts to the next time, and you got Suge Knight at death row, and he's walking through, and he's talking with his boy, and they're having a conversation. He's like, look, man, I just talked to Interscope executives. They're freaking out about Pac in jail. They need to, they bugging out. They need to get him out. They came to me, so want me to go to him so we can broker something to get him out. And he's like, all right. And he's, like, he's thinking how great it would be. His boy's hyping him up, telling him how Pac can take him to the next level. And you can truly see that Suge is a fan at this point, and he really wants Pac on his label because he knows how much powerful, more powerful this is going to make. And he knows that he has to go see him and get this man out of jail and put him on the label and put him on time. It also shows you, which I'm assuming we're probably going to get to, and they're probably going to show us in the next six episodes because they have plenty of time to do it is how precise Pac was the minute he got bailed out I mean that man made three movies uh, two albums was probably was working on a third did the Outlaws album I mean he was just moving and shaking and that was all like in nine months this man did it before he was killed so he knew what he was doing once he got out so you got that whole great moment with them meeting up and then Shug moves on so the next time you, you meet up with Pac Pac is actually in the library. He's in the prison library, and he's reading. They don't show you what he's reading, and you got this dude kind of come up to him, and Pac just kind of scopes him out, and then he starts scoping out the room, and he can see that there's other dudes kind of casually moving towards him, and this time, Pac's aware. He's not going to get set up or he jumped or anything of this nature, and this dude's talking to him like, you know that you heard that new song, Biggie, who shot you? He's basically putting it out there, letting you know that, you, that he was a part of it, yada, 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 and Pac just kind of gives this look, and then the other guy kind of makes a poo. Pop cold clocks him, and the other guy just kind of stops and then moves back, and he's just basically like, look, you ain't going to get me like this no more. None of y'all going to get me. I'm not going to get got like that. So that was kind of cool. And then the last best part of the scene, which is where you have Pac basically waking up and doesn't know where he's at, where you have Pac at the end, strategic and ready to go to war with Bad Boy. And he has... The great meeting with Suge, where Suge goes to meet him in prison, and they have this great dialogue and conversation about what they want to do and how they want to get out. And Suge's like, look, man, it's like, we won't put He's like, man, I do that in my sleep. He's trying to school him. It's a great, great end and start piece to this episode. I thought it was beautifully done. The whole Biggie and Pac stuff was great. I love this whole element. All right, there's that part. All right, let's jump into 2006. So 2006, after we get the great uh, Pac scene, we jump to... The 2006 task force, and they're actually in the uh, interview room, and they're interviewing uh, Corey Davis again, and they're trying to get him to flip. Uh, they're basically telling him that he's just some wannabe. He hangs out with gangsters, but he's not a real gangster. Calling him a fake gangster, calling him a wankster. Basically, like he just—he's a wannabe. He doesn't want to do nothing right. He's not trying to be a gangster. You just like hanging around the element, thinking about your daughter. You got a life ahead of you. He's like, nah, man, I'm not no snitch. You're not gonna get me to do that. They kind of lose that push off of it. Then they get a call that Russell Poole's storage, which has gone, which he hasn't paid in a couple months, is now going to be turned over. So they're going in there first to get information. While they're in there, they're having some great conversation and talking about different things. They break out Orlando Anderson's, um, basically his funeral thing, showing where his death. And they start talking about his boy. His boy was uh, D Row, and they're talking about D Row, and they're like. He's like uh, the one guy that worked for Comic He's like, man, he was a legend. And they do this great flashback to basically <laughs> how Anderson was killed. 
and they show the whole incident and how it all happened. His boy gets shot at the end, and he's up in prison, and he gets blamed for all three of them, all three murders, including uh, his own boys because of the drive-by situation. So that was crazy. So they want to go meet this guy and try to make a run at him. So they want to use the Compton PD guy who says he has a relationship with him, and he wants to go meet with them, see if they can get this guy to flip and give him more information because at this point right now, they've kind of been stonewalled. So they go up and meet with D-Row up at Pelican Bay, and he basically is like, like he's got this great repertoire with the uh, with the Compton PD guy who calls him Blondie, you know, the whole from DJ Quick's mixtape and song, and it's got this great back and forth, and they're having a conversation, and he just flat out says that Shook killed Biggie, and he, I mean, he don't even play around the thing, and basically what he wants is, he wants immunity, he wants to get moved out of there and moved over to his father, because he's got life sentences, three life sentences, so he ain't going nowhere, and he wants to live comfortably, and he'll give them all the information they want they think this is a giant win at this time they're pumped they're excited they're like yeah so the next time we see him you get a uh, detective kane the lead detective uh josh jumel and he's out finally meeting up with his son at a baseball game he's kind of got this weird thing with his wife and the other coach i don't know what the, really what they're trying to show just kind of like his his like how much different pull back and forth he's going through i don't know it's kind of weird to do a lot of that but he has a little dialogue, and then he gets a phone call, basically, from Duper, who's telling him that d Row has basically met with the, with the TV crew in an interview, and he's setting up interviews, and they really can't trust his testimony, and they think that he called his cousin, and he's lying, and it's all blowing up in their face at this point. So they go back to uh, the task force, and they're kind of having this conversation and dialogue at this point and just conversating about things, about all the different stuff that came out of it. They said how bad it was and how there was eight days of killing afterwards. They start talking about all these deaths. And then they say that the, the best thing they came out was they collected 300 guns. And they're like, what were these guns? And they're like, well, the guns are still there. So they get this great idea to start testing all the bullets. Lo and behold, they start testing all these guns and shooting bullets out of it, and one of the bullet casings matches up to the bullet casing that they have on file from Tupac's murder in Vegas, and this gun was found in Compton. That is huge, huge news. So they even do this little fun scene where they show like a pit bull's got the gun in his mouth, and these two cops are pulling Ray Rochambeau to get, <laughs> get the gun out of the, out of the pit bull's mouth, and that's the gun that actually supposedly killed Tupac. So... This will be interesting to see how this plays on going forward. They have this little post celebration uh, uh, scene where you know they're all sitting around. He breaks out the looks like Crown Royale and he's pouring it all for everybody or tequila, one of the two. And they have this kind of like this happy scene because they've gotten some information and now they're going to Vegas. So this is cool. Like where you had 97 at the time go to Vegas. Now the 2006 task force is going to go to Vegas. So episode six and seven should be real interesting to see what they pick up in information. So that's kind of where they ended off. They started in a bad place, ended up in a great place by getting lucky with some police casing, and now they're moving forward with this part. So that's cool. Now let's move on to 98. So 98. Let me just start off by saying this is 98. When this first started, it was 97, which is when Biggie got killed. So now we're almost a full year later, and they still haven't figured this out. One guy's on the case, they move pool on to another case, and he just got back off suspension. He's back in the place. And he gets, uh, runs into the other detective, and they start talking, and they're like, look, we're on the Ray Perez case. He's like, Ray Perez? He's like, yeah, this is Max X partner. They're basically saying that they think this guy is stealing cocaine out of the evidence locker. He's a detective. Well, Ray Perez is actually really big for what he did in all these things. This guy is actually the inspiration and basically the character they used for Training Day that Denzel Washington portrayed in Training Day as Alonzo. I mean, it's almost similar. You get the first scene where you get uh, Poole and his partner staking out uh, Ray Perez and they're in front of the jungles and he's in his car and he's got the, his young little Latin girlfriend coming out and it's also reminiscent of Training Day and it like blew my mind. I was like, wait a second. I've seen this before and it even has the end scene that basically matches training day with some of the same elements but this is the he is the actual inspiration for that character so i thought that was just real cool and full circle all that all works um so they're interview so they you know they're they're watching on him and they show all the different stuff at the same time that they're doing this they go and actually interview the detective um frank liga the one who actually killed Gaines in the line of duty when they you know when they had that whole thing at the beginning of the show so they interview frank liga and they ask him some questions about the whole Gaines and everybody. And he flat out says that Matt, Gaines, and Perez are all buddies. And that Perez even took the cocaine that he had booked and switched it with something else. It's kind of like a 
big, uh, you know, F you for killing his boy and really helping his boy out and wanted to give it to this guy. So he, they kind of cement what Pools thought this whole time, that they all work together, they're all buddies, and they all work for Death Row. So Pools getting all more and more in his head now that he thinks he really knows he's getting all these pieces together. But it's still hard because we're talking about cops from different divisions, detectives and all this different stuff. So he's still doing that thing. They're staking out friends. They're doing these different stuff. And then, um, you know, at the same time, he's going back to the office. And I guess during this time, he's broken it off with the other lady detective. And she's not feeling him anymore. Where it was all fun and bubbly and she was all helping him. Now she's just being rude and handing him papers and like, yeah, yeah, move on. And everybody can see the ice cold environment in there. That's really kind of brought a different uh just a different way that this whole scene's are going to play out because they have a couple of interactions where she drops off some information at his ex-partner's desk and he kind of goes over there and steals it to try to get some more information because he sees Death Row. Like I said, he got his mind working now. He's back on Death Row and everything starts moving. So he gets that going. He interviews another guy on that paper and finds out more information and the connections and how he's seen these different dudes. These, this guy is eyewitnessing all these different cops that are at these Death Row parties and he's really getting worked out. He's like, look, man, I told you about that. He meets back up with his detective while he's still staking out Perez. He's like, look, I told you about to be doing that. Don't be doing that. Don't worry about that. Look, you're going to go stake out Ray Perez. I'm going to stay here and wait for uh, Ray Perez's girl's brother, I guess, who has two felonies. And that's that's their kind of their in because he's a felon. So they can easily get a search warrant and get into this place. So they get all that. They break into Ray, Pre uh, Ray Perez's girl's place at the jungles. And you kind of see like a training day S kind of stuff. And. They, they're bringing stuff out. They find information in this booklet. It says Ray Perez all over it. At the same time, he's calling Pools like, look, we got this watch on the way. Don't interact with, with Perez. Don't do anything crazy. Stay back. Pools sees Perez pulling out. He kind of pulls up, and then they have a stand-up, and you think there's going to be a moment, but I feel like it goes back to this whole art of war where Perez kind of knows he could turn around, shoot him, and go on the run and be on some things, but he's going to outplay them and take getting arrested and work the way through. And what do you see in the next thing? They're sitting down with Perez at the end of the episode, and they're asking him questions, and he goes, I want full immunity. They're like, full immunity? Yeah, full immunity. He's like, what are you going to give me? I'll give you everything. And that's just a great way to end it. Woo! So there it is, folks. That was episode five, The Art of War. Like I said, this is the best episode to date. This was full jam-packed with information tidbits, fun different deciphering great Pac and Biggie moments the actor playing Pac is absolutely killing it Wazy is just killing this it's a great job um, love this episode can't wait this has really got me hyped up that it's gotten this good alright folks well there you have it if you're checking out last week's episodes right here I don't know if you're watching Atlanta but episode 4 right there for Atlanta Helen's up until next time folks Good night, Ted